It's going to be a loud shout in the spirit. The Bible says the shouts of joy and victory shall not depart from the tents of the righteous. You are drinking of this grace that will turn you into a sign and turn you into a wonder. You have put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in you. Job 42 from verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. I have heard of you as a theological topic. I have heard a man of God preach about you. But now my eyes, my eyes, I've heard of you like a story. I had fathers of faith said you were a healer. I heard them say once upon a time you moved. I heard that once upon a time people prophesied in your name. It was just like a theological story. But now, my eyes, I am having an experience of the things that I was told happened. That once upon a time God moved in many families. He moved in many territories. He moved in many places. And those who experienced this archived those stories, but as history. And they told us that God moved. They told us that once upon a time, his outreach power was seen. They told us once upon a time, people got up from wheelchairs. They told us once upon a time, the dead came back to life. But let me tell you this, you do not build conviction just on history. You must pass the realm and the gate of history to a realm of encounter. Job said, I have heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Encounters. John chapter 4, very quickly, from verse 39. The Bible talks about a woman, the Bible calls her a Samaritan woman that this woman would come to Jesus by the well and then they began a conversation and discerning he was a prophet she started asking him on aspects of worship and Jesus said the hour is coming when they that worship him was worshiping spirit and truth then verse 39 the Bible says she went please give it to us it says and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman out of the depth of her encounter nobody asked her to preach the fact that we have to push people to preach is a sign that they are not moving from the point of conviction it is impossible to be convicted about a spiritual reality and be silent about it there were people in scripture who Jesus himself pleaded with them to be quiet. The impact was too much for them to be quiet. The Bible says this woman now, on meeting Jesus, she went to the city. Notice that every time they had an encounter, did not, they didn't go to people. They went to cities. The madman in Gadara went to the a Decapolis. 40. And many of the Samaritans... And so when the Samaritans were come unto him, now listen, she invited them. They came based on her invitation with all kinds of doubts and fears and vacillations of opinions. But when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days. 41. And many more believed because of his own word. So number one, they believed because of her testimony. Number two, they believed because of his teaching. Now they had sat down with him and he was mentoring them. They were validating the things that she told him. 42. And said unto the woman, listen to their testimony now. This is the third level. Now we believe 
not because of your saying, madam, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. When we were coming, we were not sure of who and what we were coming to meet. But because your impact was so strong, we know you. We know your past. Now we see that you suddenly were transformed. Who did this? We need to come and meet him. So we came not because we were interested in that God. We came because we wanted to see who made this kind of impact in your life. And then step two, we sat down in his meeting and in his conference. And on hearing him teach, we stepped into the next level, believing because of our encounter. This has nothing to do. Even if you change, it's too late for us to follow you again. We have met him ourselves. It is dangerous to follow the God of another person and remain as the God of another person. You can start with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But eventually you must give him a name that comes out of your experience with him. That is the name that will preserve you. Are we blessed? Encounters are experiences. Supernatural experiences. They don't necessarily have to be visionary experiences. But they are supernatural experiences. That make spiritual reality is true to us. Now listen, the faith life is such that it cannot be carnally discerned. You must understand this. The, the spirit work and the faith life is not science. It's not sociology. It may borrow elements and aspects of these dimensions, but it's higher and greater than it. The Bible itself tells us that the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. So when you come into the faith life, the way you learn, academically speaking, the way you learn, sociologically speaking, may be useful but it may be very limited. You will need to access a dimension higher than that realm to understand spiritual things. Because the, the way spiritual things are communicated, in many ways they insult the scope of human thinking. Are we together? Why will a man hang on a tree claiming to be blameless and by so doing save the world it does not make sense in the physical realm so you have to rise higher than that realm to understand that there are spiritual laws encounters listen to me encounters create conviction the assignment of encounters is to create conviction the certainty of God the certainty of these spiritual laws let me tell you this every time you find out that there are vacillations and inconsistencies in your spiritual work the diagnosis is that your conviction is not yet strong the apostles of the lamb and the fathers of faith who represented the early church you know why many of them could die they could die because they had conviction terrorists today die because they have conviction it is not the truthfulness of what you are saying that moves you. It is the reality of it to you. I can believe a lie and believe it so strong I am willing to die. That's why when Jesus found people with conviction, it didn't matter whether the information was correct or not. He had respect for them. Conviction. So today I believe that God prospers. But then under a certain condition I begin to doubt. When you read your Bible, you will see that even the man who ordained Jesus into ministry eventually doubted who he ordained. John, who was in the wilderness, eating locusts and wild honey, Jesus came and by the prophetic he saw and said, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus said for him to baptize him, and he said, No, 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 I'm not worthy to untie even the latchet of your shoe. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so. It's an ordinance. It's a principle that scripture might be fulfilled. Now, under a situation of gross backsliding and offense, John sent the disciples and said, go and tell Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Are you the one to come or should we expect another? So just because you think you believe what you believe now, 
you will be surprised that 10 years down the line, you will be the one fighting the exact thing you believe. There are people today who do not believe in restoration because they fasted for years and said, God, if you are a restorer, restore me. And it did not happen. You see, prolonged pain is dangerous because it can force you to create a theology about God. You will bend through the lens of your pain and come up with a viewpoint about God. And if help does not come fast, you will make a doctrine out of your pain and your limitation about God. There are people today when we say God can favor people, they hate that word because it reminds them of an experience of their waiting for that dimension that did not happen. There are people today when we say God heals, they feel angry and sad. Maybe because something happened to them and they trusted God, that rougher dimension refused to show up. That is why it is important to bring Jesus to the scene here and now. Otherwise, a generation will just become historians and no longer Christians. They would carry a historic book called the Bible and now begin to talk to children. And you see, the generation of our parents, respectfully speaking, were a generation of loyalty. Even if they didn't believe you, they would respect you. But this, our arrogant generation, is a generation of proofs and science. They will ask you questions. They will not believe for nothing. You said Jesus heals, here is someone on a wheelchair. Bring your Jesus there. You said Jesus prospers, here is my house rent. It's expiring within 24 hours. They, they need that manifestation of the grace and the power of God. And if we want to redeem a people and preserve a generation, we must not only advocate the things that are true, we must sustain the grace to defend them. And the name given to that system is an encounter. An encounter creates unbendable conviction. You are willing to live and to die for that truth. Are we blessed? So someone prays in tongues today and by next week he's not even sure of what he's doing again. Someone is saved today and by next week he doesn't, he's, he's, he's not even sure whether Christianity is, 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 is a faith life that is worth his journey. Someone believes in walking in integrity today. No, no, I will not pay my way out of this and that. And two weeks later, he's not sure again. But I know whom I have believed. Are we blessed? We are discussing encounters. So that you are convicted. So that you are strengthened. Luke chapter 1. Let's look at something that Dr. Luke began to speak about. Luke chapter 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are what? Most surely believed among us. Not just believed, but most surely believed. Verse 2. It says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were what? Help me. Eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Three, we're reading to four. It seemed good to me, having had perfect understanding, perfect understanding on the strength of being an eyewitness. I was not just a, 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 benef a benefactor of history. I was there. I saw it. It says, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. Why? Verse 4. Read with me if you can see it. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So I don't just want you to respectfully receive it because you respect me. I want you to know the certainty of those things so that when I am no longer there, you will not leave with my departure. Your faith will stand. The disciples walked with Jesus for a long time. And you would think just because they were close to Jesus, they were really convicted. They were there for different reasons, pursuing their various agenda. And when Jesus now began to talk of departing, they were angry because it looked like they had wasted three years of their lives and destiny. And he said, I know what you are looking for. 
you, are, you don't yet have that conviction. In fact, here's what he told Peter. He said, Peter, Satan had desired to sift you like wheat. But he said, I have prayed for you. And he says, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Because Satan will also come to sift them like wheat. Encounters are powerful. It brings reality. It brings conviction. In Exodus chapter 3, we may not have the time to go through it. The Bible tells us about this young Hebrew hedonistic person who was already on his training to become the next pharaoh of Egypt. And then he ran away because he killed an Egyptian and he ran for his life. And here he was tending the sheep of his father-in-law. Are we together? This was the man who would become the deliverer. But imagine if God just told him, go and meet Pharaoh. Moses would have died like a bird, died like a chicken. You don't stand before Pharaoh just like that. There is something you must have seen and heard. You see, the adversities that we confront are not just scientific. You will have to come based on the strength of conviction that gives you the staying power to remain. Otherwise, you will faint and you will bend and you will run away from battle. And the Bible says if you turn aside in the day of battle, your strength is small. Are we still together? So Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep. And then the Bible says he saw a bush that began to burn and yet not consume. It's amazing how God lures people into encounters. He will expose you to something that dumbfounds your philosophy. Something will just happen in your life that will force you to not sleep in the night. You will get up and think and say, but I saw this. I saw this. Then he says, Moses, take off thy shoes for where thou standest is holy ground. Then began the conversation between the God of the Hebrews and Moses. At the end of that conversation, he said, Moses, I want to send you to Pharaoh. And Moses said, who will I tell Pharaoh send me? You didn't tell me your name. The name of a man encapsulates his ability. So he's saying, God, reveal to me the extent of your power. I know a bit about the witchcraft in Egypt. I know the gods that they have there, and I've, I've seen them. I was trained in the way of the Egyptians. I'm not ignorant about what their gods can do. What is your name? Give me an identity. Give me something that strengthens me, that no matter how Pharaoh roars like a beast, I will not chicken away. And God says, I am that I am. What a name. Go and tell Pharaoh, you met a God who is not, who is not limited. I am that I am. He says, tell Pharaoh, I am had sent you. When Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, thus said the God of the Hebrews, let my people go, Pharaoh laughed. You would think Pharaoh would say, wow, who is that God? I respect him. If there is one attribute about Satan that is worth emulating is that he has a dogged resilience. You must come up with a system of resistance for him to flee. He's not going to flee just because the Bible tells you you are victorious. No. Resist the devil and he will flee. So you need encounters. In Acts chapter 9, the Bible talks about Saul who would later become Paul, the apostle that would write to third of the New Testament. The Bible says as, as a scribe and a Pharisee, this guy would obtain letters from the priest and go and persecute Christians. And he believed by so doing that he was doing God's service. And then while on his way to Damascus, the Bible records that he had an encounter. The other disciples with him and, the, and, and, and those who were with him just knew that there was a sound, but he saw what the Bible called the light. And he heard a voice from the light, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, you cannot kick against the priest. He said, who are you, Lord? Notice that every time people encountered God, they asked him about him. The fact that we are not asking means that there is something about him we have not found. Because you will need to ask, who are you? He said that, but I, that I may know him. It was a psalmist that said, Oh Lord, you are my God. I think 63. Psalm 63 or so. Early will I seek you. My soul longs for you. My heart thirsts for you. 
in a dry and weary land where there is no water. He says to see your power and your glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. This was the cry of a man who desired to know God. Saul would later become Paul with a depth of persuasion and he was willing to die and would make audacious statements for for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You don't speak like that without conviction. Our generation knows how to live but we don't know how to die for the things we believe because we lack conviction. And the Christianity that will last is one that you will both be able to live and die for the truth you believe. It is true. Are we together? Conviction. Apostle God is calling me into the healing ministry. Do you believe in healing? I think I do. I read Papa Hagin's book. Wonderful. You're reading history. You need an encounter. You, when you stand before a wheelchair, I assure you, He's not going to have the patience to hear you read Papa Hagin's books. So you read because scriptures should lead you into an experience. Is it not in your Bible? He said, ye search the scripture, for in them you think you will find life. He said, the scriptures testify of me. That means the scriptures are signposts. They should cultivate a hunger and lead you to want to know a person. It should not just end in letters. It should cultivate and spur a hunger in you. can know about God by reading, but you know him by an encounter. Are we blessed? I want to share very briefly the dimensions of encounters that we will need in our lives to be effective as Christians, to be effective as ministers, and to be effective as kingdom ambassadors. God is counting on us even in this end time, to be able to be promoters of his interest. And it's not just going to happen just by desire or zeal. We will need solid encounters that will help us frontier the, the course of the kingdom within our territories. And the Lord revealed this to me, that there are four levels of encounters. Please listen carefully. We are going to pray. It's safe to say tonight is a prayer meeting. So you can see this just as a charge to just warm up our spirit so that we pray a bit. Four levels of encounter. There is no Christian, and believe me, I say this by the authority of God's word. No believer in Christ will ever be effective as far as representing the purposes of the kingdom is concerned if you do not pass through these four levels of encounters. They represent the boundaries of spiritual growth. You must have these encounters. It is non-negotiable if you intend to live for God and if you intend to access the grace that empowers you to represent his purposes. Are we together? Number one. The first level of encounter that we need is an encounter with Jesus, the Son of God. Please write it down. An encounter with Jesus, the Son of God. John 17 and verse 3, Jesus is praying now. And he said, this is eternal life. He lifted up his eyes to pray, John 17 and verse 3, that this is life eternal, his own definition, that they may know thee, the one and true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life starts with your confession on stage, but it is a journey, a journey, an unfolding it is not just receiving the life of God and stopping there. It is a journey of exploring the riches of the person Christ. The first encounter in order of priority that you must have if you want to last and if you want your Christianity to be solid is an encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God. 1 John chapter 5, please. Give us from verse 11 and 12. 1 John chapter 5. 
1 John chapter 5. He says, this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. Eternal life. It says, and this life is in his son. Verse 12. So that he that hath the son. Now watch this. The Bible says the life of God, what we call Zoe, cannot be received outside of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the custodian of that life. So to check whether you really have his life, we must check whether you have met him. He said that the character of that life is such that you cannot receive it outside of a relationship with Jesus. That that life is in his son. So that he that had the son had that life. And he that had not the son does not have life. If I put some money in my pocket and you ever claim that that money is in your hand, it means you would have at least met me and even gone that far to reach into my pocket. Is that true? You cannot claim to have what is in my pocket and you've not had any contact with me. So the Bible says that life is not something you pick independent of Jesus. Now, you have to understand that there are different levels and kinds of life. I hope you know that. There is a biological life given to everyone. There is life that is activated by your fraternity with demon spirits. It's higher than the biological life, but it's not the life of God. It can give you an advantage. You can conjure sorcery and witchcraft and live a quality of life that is higher than a natural person. And yet it is not the life of God. You can live a life that is sponsored by by the wealth of intellectual prowess. You are intelligent. You have un explored the principles of life. It will give you a quality of living that is higher than the natural person. And yet that is not the life of God. So there are different kinds and different levels of life. And the Bible says so that you do not mistake in them. If it is the life of God you are talking about, then you must have met the Son. Whosoever has not met the Son, even if you have been in church, you do not have his life. Are we blessed? John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus was teaching and he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and then to destroy. But he said, I am come. This is why I have come now. That ye may have life and that you have it more abundantly. You can have, listen, it's one thing to have life. But it's another thing to have more abundant life. They all receive harvest, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. It's all harvest, but the quality of it. So two believers can be in the kingdom born again, and their Christian experience can be so different. You will wonder if it's different gods that are ministering the faith life to them. Because one may have life, another one may have more abundant life. It was the Lord of the harvest that gave all of them harvest, but some 30-fold some 60-fold, some 100-fold. It was not the seed, it was the soil that was the determinant of the extent of the harvest. Is God helping us? An encounter with the life of God. John chapter 3 and verse 16, popular scripture, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Now, theologically speaking, you know that he's no longer the only begotten. He was the only begotten as at the time of, the, of his dying. But now he's the firstborn among we the begotten because he has grafted and called us the many sons now into glory. Right? So it's not just the only begotten that whosoever believes in him should not perish, he says, but have life everlasting. This is the gospel of salvation. You need an encounter with Jesus, the Son of God. If you do not know this, the appetite and the strength for evangelism will not be there, even if you are an evangelist. Why do I need to reach someone and talk to him about Jesus? It's more than just trying to get him to escape from hell. That is very important. The eternal security of his destiny is important, but also the quality of his living while he's here on earth. If he's to access the life of God, then it has to be through Jesus, the Son of God. Now, please look at me. Jesus is not an archangel. Jesus is not even an angel. Are we together now? Jesus is not a man. He became a man. 
If you say Jesus is a man, that means someone created him. He became a man means he brought himself to be a man. Are you getting my point now? Yes. Jesus, the Bible tells us the logos of God, the word of God. He became a man for the sake of men. Are we together? And I've shared it again and again why he went to heaven in his body. He went to heaven as a man so that he can come back. Because if, if he went as a spirit, he would need to look for a body to come back. But the angel said, this Jesus you have seen, he will return. There is a law called the law of territory. You cannot operate in this realm. Whether you any kind of spirit, including God, you must have a body that escorts you here. So the word became flesh so that it would dwell among us. Then we beheld his glory. So he went back bodily so that he can return now. It is going with his body that assures us that it's not a scam that is coming back. The assurance of salvation is that he was justified in the flesh. That's why the Bible calls it the mystery of godliness. That God became a man. And today he's seated at the right hand of the father, not as a spirit, with the same body he used on earth. So we know that he can return back because there's no hindrance to his coming. The condition for his returning is that you have a body and he has that body. And that is also why he can still act on earth because he still has a body called the church. It's the body of Christ. So he can still use that body to walk. Are we blessed? An encounter with the Son of God. When people are not saved and they don't take Jesus serious, when our family members are not saved and they don't take Jesus serious, it's not just, it's not just the issue of evangelism alone. It is death. It is death. Both here in this life and outside of that life. You will say, oh, apostle, but they are rich. Let me tell you. There is a vacuum that God created in man that only his size can fill. Money cannot fill it. Education cannot fill it. I've had the privilege to be around a few successful people and I can tell you, regardless of all of those physical things, there is a peace that only God, he said, peace I give you, my peace. There is the type you can get when you build a house. Congratulations. There is a type you can get when you go to school. There is a type you can get when you have children. But there is a kind of peace only God gives. He said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Anyone who claims to have that peace without Jesus is lying. My highest definition of success is peace. More than progress, more than achievements, peace. There are many people today who will pile up their achievements like a rubble and set it on fire in search for peace. The peace of God is a gift. You can sit in the midst of storms and laugh by an agency ordinary human beings cannot explain. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid of? One of the proofs that you have met the Son is peace. That is peace in your heart. You see, this, this running around that people do around life, hey, hey, there is nothing that is truly an emergency when you have the peace of God because you are assured that even in life and in death, you are victorious. But you see, many times when we save people, we miss the peace part. I know you are saved. Not just that I check. I cannot see that righteousness. It's a gift and it's spiritual. But I can see the peace of God in you. Peace is not carelessness makes me to lie down in green pastures because you are already crucified with Christ and it is appointed for men to die once and if you are you are dead once already the devil will not trouble you again the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is is in a realm that is higher than understanding so someone looks at you and says you are stupid because the peace of God is in you. It secures you. You, you are not looking to prove a point. To say, look, I, I will show you. I'm, no, 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 no. That is, that is the life of one who does not have the son. 
the security that that peace gives you, gives you rest. Just to let you know that your salary will not come this month. And that trouble wants to come and the peace of God says, go to bed. If God is awake and you are awake, who is leading who? If he's awake, sleep. He is called the keeper, not just the owner of Israel, the keeper of Israel. That's a language of responsibility. Everybody say, I have peace. Prophesy to every trouble. Say, I have peace. For God's sake, there are people who continue to die. Did you know, I say it humorously, sir, you know, BP and high blood pressure used to be something for people maybe in their 50s or 60s. But now you see someone 20, 21 having high blood pressure because there is a manipulation. Satan is manipulating this system and robbing us of the value of peace. We give up our peace in a heartbeat searching for mundane things. Let me tell you, if you have ever asked, what do I have that a non-believer does not have? If it's a house, you lied. If it's education, you lied. Let me tell you one thing that they do not have, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So you walk out of this place today feeling happy, knowing that I may not have all the money in the world, but I have peace. The peace of God and peace with God. There are two different things. I have peace with God that I know that if my life evaporates from this realm, it's only a door that opens to a place of rest according to the authority of scripture. So I am not, I, I do not move as though I do not have a future and a destiny. No, I serve his purposes. And if for any reason I exit this life, you tell people, don't weep like those who do not have hope. Because to be absent in the body, is to be present with the Lord. Peace. The peace of God. Many believers do not have peace. I tell you this. Many people do not have peace. Lack of peace has broken marriages. And they think the cause is, is the spouse. They are looking for something neither of them can give themselves. It's only the prince of peace that can give that. And this life is in his son. Is God helping us tonight? That whosoever had the son had that life. If, if, if we stop here tonight, you have learned something. That you can walk out of this place with peace. You can stand and the bills are staring at you. You can stand and the sickness, they say there is something. Yes, you will trust God for healing, but not by worrying. There is peace. That I know that the worst of it is still victory for me. Peace. Oh, believers, we need to grow up. There is what the world cannot give. The world can give you land. The world can give you permission to build. The world can give you secular education. Hear me. The world can give you promotion. They can give you awards. But there is one thing that no market can sell. There is one thing that no bank can keep. There is one thing that no security system can guard. It's called the peace of God. Administered by the prince of peace himself. find me by the grace of God Almighty putting my hand on my chin and saying life oh no oh no I already know the worst that can happen to men is called death and the Bible says oh death where is your sting do you know what that means hold on do you know what that means that like like the like the sting of a of a what they call that of a scorpion you see that now it has lost its power because death is two things. One, it can be doom for someone. Or number two, it can be an entrance, a door that leads to another realm. They are all called death. It is within your power to choose which one. By that death, I, I don't just mean cessation of life. I mean transition to another reality. They are all called death. 
tonight. Please find peace tonight. We worry too much. We have given the devil lands. Where is my child now? What, what if they destroy him? What uh -uh, The keeper of Israel. That child is only a loan to you. No matter how responsible you are, there, there are limits to which you can you learn to rest. Enter your Sabbath, my soul. Find rest. Lord, I know that I need my child's school fees tomorrow. Otherwise, I will be in trouble. And I, it's human to be afraid and to think, but later on, just remember, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not irresponsible. If you being evil, know how to give good gifts. Lord, I rest in the conviction that you are Abba, my source, my sustainer, and my defender. Let your jealousy vindicate me, even within this time. Let me tell you this. The Bible says, stand still and then you will know. There is an information about God that only being still brings. Stand still and you will know that I am God. If you can't be still, you will not see that dimension. Stand still. I know the rent issue is before you, but stand still. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not stupid. I'm a human being too. I know that sometimes it's difficult to stand still before certain things. The medical report, the issue, the backlash from your family members. I've not seen the benefit of your Christianity. You are just praying vigils upon vigils. You've been praying for vigils, vigils, no child, no husband, no wife, no this, no money. And sometimes you feel stupid for being a child of God. But I bring you good news. The prince of peace is still on the throne. And let me tell you, he knows how to administer that peace. The peace of God is not just emotional comfort. It's that he resolves all the things that must make sure the turbulence in your mind goes away. So that you can have true rest. Are we blessed? An encounter with the Son of God. And within the few minutes I have left, somewhere along in this service, I will be making an altar call. That there are people who really need to know the son. I don't care whether you've been around church, you've been around... No, no, no. Listen, let me tell you, we must take the issue of the salvation of souls very seriously. It's not just to ease the guilt of feeling like you are not serious with your Christian life. Our passion must move past that realm. We must desire that people have this peace. The peace of God and peace with God. God is not mad at me. I have peace with God. Ah, God does the No, no, no. All that one is stories. Peace with God. Peace with God. Peace with God. And then the peace of God at work in your life. You can look at the things that should make you angry and just smile. And they say, are you all right? You mean it? Your car was stolen. And people say, we ran and came because we suspected you faint. I said, no, 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 faint is too far. I understand your sense of responsibility, but I have peace. You mean you are sleeping? Yes, sir. Why? Because a man can receive nothing except it is given to him. Please learn to find rest and find peace. So what do we have as a result of our encounter with the Son of God? Quickly, let me finish number one. You know, we're just in number one. The first thing that you receive with your encounter with Jesus is in Romans 5.17. It's called access to righteousness. This is the first thing that you receive as a result of your encounter. When you truly encounter the Son, you receive the gift of righteousness. Right standing before God. That's the foundation for peace. Knowing that that which creates a divide between you and Jesus Christ has been taken away. That barrier has been taken away. If by one man's offense, the Bible says, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by Jesus. Take it higher for me, Elijah. That, I want to sing that song that says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Please, you need to cast fear. Cast fear. Cast fear. 
cast fear from your mind, cast fear from your life. I have the righteousness of God. Right standing with God. That he loves me. Are we together now? Romans 5, 17. And then number two, very quickly. What do you have as a result of your encounter with Jesus, the Son of God? You have the life of God. So wait. The life of God. According to 1 John 5, 11 and 12. I'm being very simple so that we can have something down. So the righteousness of God gives you room to have the life of God. The righteousness of God comes as a result of your being justified by faith. The Bible says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He says, being made a curse for us, for it is written, is a law that has been written, that cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham is not cars and houses. The blessing of Abraham is justification by faith. The blessing of Abraham would come upon we the Gentiles, comma, to the end that we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So justified by his blood. I have peace with God. Oh, your village people were idol worshippers. I know. They ate human beings. I know. But right now I have made peace with God through the blood of the eternal covenant. This is very powerful. Righteousness gives you access to the life of God. And then number three, what do you receive as a result of your encounter with Jesus Christ? You have access to the spiritual blessings that reside in heavenly places. The peace of God being chiefest of them. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul is teaching now. Thanks be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So in Christ, I have access to those spiritual blessings. That's what we call grace. The grace of God is not just unmerited access. Uh -uh. That's just a dimension of the workings of that grace. The grace of God represents the entire scope of everything that makes God God. His peace is grace. His wisdom is grace. Are we together? His power is grace. Anointing is grace. His mercy is grace. Every good and perfect gift that comes from above through Christ to men is called grace. Let's take one more before we close for tonight. Is that fine? The second encounter that we need is an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is the second encounter that you will need for an effective Christian life. In that order, an encounter with Jesus, the Son of God, and now an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Please look up. Now, theologically speaking, and as revealed from Scripture, doctrinally speaking too, the Holy Spirit is responsible for the conviction of sinners. Are we together now? The Holy Spirit is the transporter of the life of God. He aids men to encounter Jesus. But there is a unique and separate encounter with the Holy Spirit that is independent of the initial encounter with the Son of God. You have to understand this. In as much as he is the facilitator of the life you receive, there is an encounter with the office and the person of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4 and verse 6. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. That I'm no longer a slave to fear. Please give it to us, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. And he answered and said unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord to Joshua Selman, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith an angel, saith the Lord. The Lord is telling you, I am here as the Lord, but you still need my spirit. 
it is the Lord that is talking about his spirit. But by my spirit, there are dimensions of possibilities that when you see in this earth realm, it is not sponsored by the might of men. It is not sponsored by the power of men. It is an attestation to an encounter that you have had with the Holy Ghost. Please listen. Please listen. You have to listen to what I have to share. Within the few minutes and then we'll pray. In John chapter 14. John 14. John chapter 14. From verse 16, Jesus is teaching, and he said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Are we together now? That he may abide with you forever. We are reading to 18. Even the spirit of truth, that's what he's called. Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit now. Whom the world cannot receive. Why can't they receive? Two reasons. Number one, because it seeth him not. That means the character of that relationship is such that your physical eyes may not be necessary. He's giving you that information. Social media has taught us that you can have friends you have not seen physically. So they have helped us to understand the possibility of a healthy relationship with the Holy Spirit, even though your optical eyes may not see him. It says, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit. And then when you get to chapter 16, he said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He said, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus is introducing us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying he will come and guide the believer. Not pastors, not Pentecostals. No, not tongue talkers. That the ministry of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Micah chapter 3 and verse 8, last scripture. Micah chapter 3 and verse 8. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is responsible for guidance. The Holy Spirit is responsible for direction. The Holy Spirit creates a platform for fellowship. And the Holy Spirit creates a platform for empowerment. All of these possibilities only happen when you encounter the person and the office of the Holy Spirit. You may have the life of God in your encounter with the Son of God and never access these possibilities. You need this level of encounter with the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, many believers have not been taught about the relevance and the importance of the Holy Spirit. For most people, they think the Holy Spirit is for men who are interested in prayer or interested in fasting. Or if at any point you sense there is the call of God upon your life. The moment you just want to live a sociological life, you feel the Holy Spirit is not relevant at all. The Holy Spirit's relevance cuts across every strata of our activities. He has value always. Spiritual value, intellectual value, financial value, value in terms of influence, value in terms of relevance, value in terms of no matter, you, you cannot mention an aspect of life where the Holy Spirit is not needed. We have ignored him to our peril. We have left him only for pastors and left him for people who are working in the healing ministry or those who want to pray in tongues as we say. No. Write this down. There are four major responsibilities of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Very quickly, number one, he is the revealer of the word. Let me give you scriptures for this very quickly. 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 9 to 12. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it come into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, it says, but God has revealed them, revealed them. How? By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
And then the Bible says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of that man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Ah! That means, if you ever find me giving you an information that I could not access in God, it had to be the spirit of God who brought it. The Holy Ghost is the revealer of the mysteries of the kingdom. Listen, let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit can hold you and open you up to the mysteries of the kingdom and turn your life to a sign and a wonder, regardless your background, regardless the limitations. This is very true. He's the one who has made this life that you see today. The Spirit of God. He can turn you literally into a provable sign and wonder. Now I understand what great people like Catherine Kuhlman and all these people would cry and sob for hours and say he's my best friend. Do not let him depart from me. Don't grieve him. It looked like they were just being emotional. You see, many things about Christianity looks fake until you really encounter those dimensions. Take your place, take your place, you are the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, you are the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, take your place. Take your place. What is the relevance of the Holy Spirit? He is the confirmer of the word. Listen very carefully. The word is a barren piece of paper without his presence. He gives life and he proves the validity of what you study. It is the Holy Spirit that makes the word come alive. Otherwise, you are just reading history. You are reading a book produced by Zondervan or White Taker House. You are just reading a piece of historic material. It is the Holy Spirit that brings life. The quickener of the word. The Bible says, write it down please. The Bible says in Isaiah 44 from verse 24 to 26. Please media help us. Let's just rush. Our time is up. Isaiah 44 from verse 24 to 26. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer. He that formed thee from the womb and so on and so forth. Go to 25. That frustrated the tokens of liars and makest diviners mad. He turned wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. Now, 26. That confirmed the word of his servant and performed the counsel of his messengers. It's one thing to speak and just speak empty words. But the Holy Ghost is that force. The invisible but real force. You see, the only way to understand your relationship with the Holy Ghost is to understand marriage. Huh? To understand marriage. When two people are getting married, notice what happens. The man is standing this way. Are we together? Many of you are smiling now. What a good example. I just mentioned the issue of marriage. And then the wife is standing there. Now watch this. They don't even know how the journey is going to be. The man is smart with his necktie or bow tie. The friends are there cheering him. And the lady is standing looking gorgeous. Her 15-year-old dream, 16-year-old dream finally coming to pass. And they ask a question. Listen now. Do you take this woman as your lawfully wedded wife, etc., etc.? He doesn't even listen. He says, yes, I will. Are we together? And they ask her the same question and she says, yes, watch this. Then they join them together. And they say, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and two of them become what? One flesh. Theologically, it's a, it's a concept called the doctrine of interpenetration. It's the mystery by which two entities become one. It's the mystery of what we call the salt covenant. That means everybody brings their salt and you put it together. And the condition for separation is if everybody can pick their salt out. So you and the Holy Ghost, I hope you know the church is called the Bride of Christ. So there is a marriage that really happens. That you stand and the, the husband, listen, 
any responsible man's assignment is to make sure that his wife feels loved and is comfortable. Remember, the assignment of men is to love their wives. And the assignment of the bride is to honor her husband. Are we Bible students? So every man is a woman in the spirit. So when you see me stand here, I'm standing like a faithful bride. That husband must be there to confirm that our marriage is still in place. So, listen, if, if a man is a CEO and is a multi-millionaire, and even if he didn't discuss with his wife and she comes to say, well, on behalf of my husband, I donate 1,000 shares. For the sake of his love for her, they can argue it later on. But he will have to back and redeem that pledge. Because that man, if he cannot cater for his wife, he has shown irresponsibility. Are we together now? Every marriage that is healthy must see the signature of the husband on the woman. Is that true? So when the signs and the wonders and the manifestations of heaven happen through a mortal man, it is that husband showing that the union is still strong. He's showing that you are like, it is unfortunately in this union, it is the wife that you see. You don't see the husband, but he's there, jealously there. And the Bible said jealousy is the rage of a man. So when you speak, you put in pressure on the integrity of that husband. In the name of Jesus, be lifted. And then that husband swings to action. Now, it looks like you are using him. But he said, wives, honor. You see, so when people are clapping for you, any responsible wife will say, thank my husband. Madam, your soup is nice. Madam, your soup is this. And a wise and responsible woman will know that I am an usher. Vashti made that mistake. She forgot that she was only queen because she married the king. And when she created an empire for herself, Ahasuerus moved her away. Esther was about to make that mistake. But Mordecai, standing in the place of the Holy Spirit, warned her and said, Don't forget, a vacancy was created before you came. And she met the king. And the king lifted his golden censer and said, What would I do for you? And she didn't ask anything for herself. She said, oh, king, I want to organize a ceremony for you. I want to flaunt your glory. And the king said, this is what Vashti failed to do. So if I be lifted up from the earth, not you, not your agenda, not your ministry. So when we worship him, we are like a faithful wife putting pressure on our husband. When we give him the glory, when men clap for us and make it look as if all that happens is a fabrication of our intelligence, we are wise enough to understand that we are faithful brides and we direct them like ushers to that spirit of God who represents the presence of Jesus to us. And God said, you did this for me. You had the opportunity to enjoy the stage light, but you turned men to me. Let's go. Another level of miracles. Another level of signs and wonders. A man is a dimension of God. A Listen, I hope you know that marriage has nothing to do with a man and a woman. A man is a dimension of God. A woman is a dimension of God. God separated two of them to act out the highest dimension of relationship. Marriage is supposed to be the closest way to know God. And so he doubled that while doing that, there's an opportunity for procreation and advancing and filling the earth and subduing it. A woman is a dimension of God. A man is a dimension of God. As two of them relate, the first revelation of Jesus that should be seen by children is in their parents. So whether the children look at the husband or the wife, they are still seeing dimensions of God. They should learn God before they get to Sunday school. This is the way you father me. I love the way you father me. This is the way you father me. I love the way you father me. Take my body, my soul, my spirit. Breathe on me. Take my body, my soul, my spirit.
intimacy with the Holy Spirit, again is akin to marriage. Do you know when a man is married with his wife, they have through intimacy learned various ways of communicating that you will be surprised. A stranger cannot know it. You can be a visitor in their midst and they are talking and yet you cannot hear. Because through that relationship they have developed codes that mean get minerals for him and yet you don't hear the mouth speaking. So to really know how the Holy Spirit operates, you cannot know him theologically. That marriage must happen. It is while you are walking with the Holy Ghost. One time he will now teach you that every time you go to minister, that fire you feel, this is what it means. You can't create a doctrine out of it. It's a personalized dealing unique to you as a testament of your relationship. What that fire may mean to me may mean different to someone else. That's why creating doctrines out of experiences who mislead the body. There is a way he has trained me to know what anointing is in a place. There is a way he has trained me to know what angel is in a place. These are not things that can be taught. I can only create the portal for his presence to come and leave you there with him. It's a relationship you will have to develop. It's like driving. I can show you everything. But eventually, as you start driving there, you will develop a chemistry with that car. Take your place. Take your place. Take your place. Take your place. The Holy Spirit the custodian of the anointing. Please, do the best you can as God grants grace to not miss tomorrow's service. Even if it's a sacrifice, you need to listen to what I have to teach. We're only on one and a half. And this is very important. I'm introducing you to a personality you have neglected. I'm introducing you to a real relationship a provable relationship. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, if many of you have created a box for your jewelries, many of you have garages for your car, show me where you have created for him. Many of you have created, you guard your ATM with such jealousy. Oh, let it not get missing. The whole house will go on fire. But where have you kept for him? And you see, the Holy Spirit is so gentle. He will not intrude because he's not a demon. He will stand even if it is for 30 years and just watch you with the compassion of the Father. Dear businessman, have you been taught that if you introduce him to the equation of your business, that it can change things? Or have you just listened to videos that have just taught world from a scientific point? Do you know the Holy Spirit is, a, is the advantage? Have you introduced him to your home? Look at my life. Many times I look and I say, Spirit of God. Oh, that these people would know that you are the force behind the things they celebrate. That if there is anything worth celebrating in the life of this man, let me tell you, the man you are seeing before you is only a puppet. You need to see the force that is behind. Like a faithful bride to her husband. So when you see me coming here, you think a man just walked in. But you have not seen the other one. Husbands, love your wives. It is on the strength of that jealousy that we boast. Every woman's confidence is in the love of her husband. So when you are aware, what gives the audacity to speak to someone and say, by tomorrow your life will change? Who gave you that audacity? I tell you where it comes from. It comes from the confidence of your oneness. That the one that married you so happens to be an infinite, a represent. Paul called him the great power of God. Can we pray? Our time is gone. Listen, many situations in our lives have not changed because we are not ready to take the Holy Spirit serious. The Holy Spirit is more than tongues. Please hear me. 
the Holy Spirit is more than ministry. Mm. Do you know that certain people in life can be blessed for the sake of others? Is there any man in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Do you know many things can happen in your life for the sake of the Holy Spirit or on account of him? He is the force that makes that favor upon you speak. That someone sees you and says, I just like this person. No, nobody just likes this person. There is a force behind it. It's time to take your life and your relationship with him serious. For many of you, you started well with him. But I don't know what happened on the way. You just left him because ministry started working well. Some of you left him because you entered a physical relationship. The day you married, you waved him goodbye. Instead of telling your husband before you came here was one long. Hmm. I would give up ministry a thousand times to preserve his presence. A thousand times I would drop this mic without thinking about it. Take your place. We're praying. Take your place. It's not a special number. Take your place. Listen, just two prayer points and we're done. I apologize for the time. Prayer point number one. Spirit of the living God, take me on this journey. I'm tired of acting a Christianity that I cannot prove. I submit to you sincerely. Is someone praying? Jesus gave him an, as an advantage to us. As an advantage to us. Please pray. Please pray. Man of God, pray. I do not doubt the call of God upon your life. I know that there is a hand of God upon you. But you will not excel in ministry on the strength of the flesh. I know he's called you into business. I know he's called you to be an influential person. body, my soul, my spirit, breathe on me. Take my body, my soul, my spirit. Shalabakata brans katalika. Shekete katapakarusa siata. Embrete kalisa sabakarusa tariata. Manta brakata katabrate seketele kata. Shekete katekete barus kebazia. Mandas kaparuta sadabalakata. Rekete katekete katabrato soto balata. Take your place. Take your place. Take your place. Ah. The quickener. The one who guides. The one who turns ordinary men to signs and wonders. The spirit of truth. The spirit of grace. The spirit of God. The representation of the presence of God. Balandas calabras que bede hashela nusiata. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One last prayer. There is one thing I know about God. There is nothing that attracts the presence of God to a man like total surrender and brokenness. Let me tell you this more than prayer more than fasting, more than vigils, in my experience with God and as proven from scripture, the greatest magnet to the attention of God is a broken and a contrite heart. You can pray, you can fast, you can attend vigils, but I tell you this, you want to draw the attention of God, there is a position. A heart that says, Lord, I'm completely open. We are going to cry for a few minutes in this place. Listen to me. I don't care whether you're a man of God. I don't care whether you're a pastor. Uh-uh. You are going to take off your golden crown and join the elders. You are going to say, Lord, purge me. My heart is open. There is an experience I seek for. There is a dimension of reality. If you are ashamed to cry before God, you are not serious. Believe me. Believe me. Believe me. 
your voice. Cry before your maker. Outside, make sure you are praying. Few minutes and we're done. Cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before, keep praying, your royal majesty. I truly cast my crown before the highest royalty. Before your glorious majesty, you're the king of kings and lords. cry my heart. One minute, pray. It is only when the sacrifice is upon the altar that the fire falls. The fire cannot come until there is a sacrifice upon the altar. One more minute. Some of you are crying. Don't be ashamed of your tears. I come to you, the lover of my soul. Somebody is praying. Would you dance with me, oh, lover of my soul? To the song of all songs. A new relationship. Would you dance with me? pray. I apologize, but let, let, that, let that alabaster box break. Let it break once and for all. As you are praying, God will be calling you. For some of you, God is saying, you've neglected me. You've neglected the praise of prayer and fellowship. What so distracted you? Like the prodigal son, he said, I will arise and I will go back to my father. Say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Please pray. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. 
like you to sing this Yoruba song for me. Olorun Toda time is gone but very quickly there are two categories of people that I'm going to be praying for the first there are people here who are saying apostle while you were speaking that spirit of the living God was speaking to me and saying it's time to get serious with God you may hang around church some of you were probably invited like the Samaritan woman invited those people but now the Bible says they believed him because of his word. And now you are in a position where you are ready to make Jesus Lord genuinely. Genuinely. Sincerely. And truly so. Our time is fast spent and I sincerely apologize. But like our father in the Lord would do, I'm going to count one to five. Whether you are inside or outside. I want you to just run and come and stand here. Don't kneel because of space sincerely make sure you understand what you are doing that you are saying apostle i'm ready i'm ready to completely hand over everything to jesus you can come one i have decided to follow jesus no turning back keep coming no turning back i have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Keep coming. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I love Jesus, but I'm ashamed of my friends. Join them. Apostle, I, I, don't, I don't do bad things, but I'm not sure if I'm really saved. Join them. Very quickly, I want to pray for you. We're standing here joining faith with the fathers. And we want to pray. This is the record. Listen to me. There is no reason to be ashamed. It's the greatest decision anybody can make. It is true. This is not some Christianity initiation. It's a real experience that affords you the opportunity to be a partaker of the life of God. Hallelujah. All of you who are standing, I salute you young and old for this bold decision. Thank you for standing to make this decision for Jesus. I'd like you to lift your right hand high above your head if you can. Repeat these words not as a poem. Let it be from the depth of your heart. I'm merely guiding you. It's the sincerity and the purity of your own decision that attracts the attention of God. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. 
that you are the son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again for my justification. Tonight, I make Jesus Lord of my life, King of my life, Savior of my soul. I receive eternal life and the gift of righteousness. And I declare that from tonight and forever, the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave are broken over my life. From today and forever, I will serve the Lord. Amen. Keep your hands lifted. Father, I present to you the ones you died for. Thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, O oh God, for this decision. Many of them are in tears, coming to you to receive your life. I pray that you, who is the keeper of men, will keep them. Spirit of the living God, I commend you to their lives, and I pray that they will enjoy the fullness of your ministry, that you turn every life here to a sign and a wonder. In the name of Jesus. Now, please, all of you look at me. There is, there is a brother here and an uncle who is waving uh, the, the, the placard up. I want all of you to just follow him quietly as we clap for them. They will lead you to a room and just pray with you, and you'll be back. Let's, let's appreciate them. Let's celebrate them. Praise the Lord. We have to close, but um, I know that many of you have come desiring prayer. And, and all of that, uh, we, we cannot do that tonight, I apologize. Let's make it tomorrow where we'll have the time to just prophesy over your life and just pray for the sick and minister. I'd like you to come with your heart opened and let the Lord finish what he started in your life in this conference. But for tonight, I pray for you. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare the kind of hunger for the things of God that nothing in this life can quench. May that hunger come upon you. I release upon you passion for spiritual things. And everything that represents a distraction to your Christian experience, in the name of Jesus, I drive it far from your life. Everything that has mocked God in your life, I release my faith. For many of you, between tonight and tomorrow, I stand by the grace of God and I declare, in the name of Jesus, you will watch that challenge disappear like smoke before the wind. For many of you, you will return back home and you will meet strange miracles waiting for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I decree and declare that the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless all connected to you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.